so the way this webinar is going to work a little bit is I'm going to introduce our guest speaker and then I'll hand it over to him. And if you can see in the video, you see this nice picture of all these baits. You only see his face during his introduction and then he'll be pointing out features of different kinds of artificial baits for everybody. So I'll start off with my name is Andrew Wooldridge. I'm a conservation educator for the department. So I recruit new anglers and keep current anglers. So these are different kinds of stuff that I work with regularly. So, um, so as you've asked me, or as I asked Becky to start recording, this is being recorded. So if you don't want anybody to see your face or anything, you know, turn your video off. But at any time, feel free to unmute yourself, ask questions, we're perfectly fine with that. If you want to type them in the chat, that's fine as well. Myself and Becky will be watching the chat and we'll ask the question out loud so everyone can hear. Um, and if you just want to wait till the end to ask your questions, that's perfectly fine as well. I do plan at the end to present Jay with some fishing scenarios and then we can get his input on what bait he would start with in that scenario. So if you've got something like that, you got your favorite fishing spot and you're not really sure what to use, you can at the end you can describe it to us and we'll try to get you started with some baits to throw. So if you'll give me just a second, I will get Mr. Jay Wallen going. What's up, guys? I am Jay Wallen here to talk to you all a little bit about some artificial lures, uh, some of my favorites, uh, some of the staples here in Kentucky that have uh, worked for me and historically worked for a lot of other people uh, here locally. Uh, this will cover some stuff from uh, spring all the way uh, through fall. Uh, probably won't get into too much wintertime baits, but uh, we can talk about that if you guys have any questions. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about springtime lures. We'll talk about colors, different styles, uh, some of the techniques, some of the places that you might use some of these baits. Um, uh, be happy to answer any questions uh, and just cover some different scenarios and help you guys be successful out there on the water this year. So uh, without too much more introduction, uh, we'll get right to it. And, you know, it's spring. It's a beautiful day today. And we'll get started talking about uh, what I would use if I was going out fishing today right now. Uh, so we'll go from spring and progress all the way through fall. So looking forward to hearing your guys' questions and going through a few scenarios with you all. And let's get started and talk about some baits. Okay. All right, guys, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Awesome, good deal. So, uh, you know, it's spring, uh, water's starting to warm up a little bit in some places. Uh, typically in the spring, you're going to get some muddy conditions. Uh, water's not always clear and clean like we like it in the uh, summertime and in the fall. But uh, one of my favorite baits to go out and start looking for bass this time of year is a square bill crankbait. Um, as you can see, I've got some bright colors out here. Uh, this time of year, like I said, you're looking at mostly stained water. You're going to have a lot of water running off into these lakes and ponds and creeks. Sorry, I was getting these baits lined up for you guys so you can see them. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, square bill crankbaits, excellent bait to throw this time of year. This particular bait is going to run anywhere from four to five feet. Uh, so this is really when you're up there looking for those shallow fish. Um, this is a good reaction bait. They'll, you know, they, they can see it, they can feel it, definitely react to it. Uh, what I like about this one is the square, you know, in its namesake, it's a square bill crankbait, uh, but the way it's shaped helps, helps it to uh, deflect off cover. You know, this is something you want to throw up into lay downs, trees, brush, uh, rock, and riprap. But uh, this is a great bait to throw early in the year uh, before these fish come up to spawn. Um, another good bait this time of year, it's also a crankbait, but it's a, uh, it's a shad wrap. Um, crawls this time of year are just coming out of hibernation and a lot of them have that red tint to them you'll see a lot of springtime baits uh, will have that red color uh, what's unique about the, this bait this shad wrap is it's made out of balsa wood and uh, it's really light so you have to kind of throw this on light tackle but uh, it's got a really tight wobble and it excels in a little bit cooler water uh, you know, when you're looking at upper 40s, low 50s, as far as water temperature goes, uh, these things right here thrown on uh, rocky banks, chunk rock banks, these are really hard to beat. Uh, a lot of those fish, when they come out of hibernation, just before they go on to spawn, um, 
you know, sorry, those crawfish come out of hibernation and the bass are getting ready to spawn, they really feed up on crawls. And uh, that's what that red color uh, is trying to represent. So uh, those two right there are some great baits uh, for early spring. Uh, and I'll cover one more crankbait for the spring and that's the uh, lipless crankbait. Uh, this is a great search tool when you're not quite sure where the fish are located. Uh, you can fish this thing out to multiple depths. Uh, you can throw it up shallow. You can fish it slow out deep. Uh, they do really good around grass as well. Uh, so if you're fishing a, a lake or a pond or something that's got a little bit of dead grass in it, uh, these lipless crankbaits are a great way to, uh, to locate bass. Um, those are just some really popular spring techniques. Uh, as you're coming out of winter time and, and the water's still a little bit cold, uh, you know, it's also hard to beat a jerk bait. I love throwing a jerk bait. Um, that gets a lot of this, those suspended fish. Uh, you know, we just had a really bad cold front this past weekend. And what will happen is you get some warm days and those fish will come up. And then when you get a big cold front, they'll kind of pull off the bank and suspend a little bit. Uh, and that's where a jerk bait like this will come in really handy. Uh, it's got a little bit deeper bill on it, so it'll dive down a little bit deep. Uh, but then it suspends and you just, you know, that's the old classic twitch, twitch, pause uh, kind of rhythm that you get going with these jerk baits. And, you know, when the conditions are tough, this is a really great bait uh, to catch those suspended fish. Now, it's not necessarily great when the water's muddy. Uh, this excels a little bit when uh, you get some clear water conditions. Great bait on Lake Cumberland, Dale Hollow, uh, Laurel River Lake, you know, some of those clear bodies of water. Uh, jerk bait can really really excel but uh, that's some of my spring lineups those are some of my hard baits that I like to throw this time of year uh, these will really catch fish from you know March all the way through um, till these fish spawn you know all the way up into April and May uh, these these baits will do really well um, another classic you know is a spinner bait um, this is a war eagle spinner bait um, Spinner bait is one of those moving baits that you can pretty much throw year round. Um, even in the middle of winter, uh, you just, you know, if the water color's uh, a little dingy, go with some of these brighter colors. Um, you know, if the water's colder, go a little bit, go a little bit deeper with it. Um, in the, like I said, in the wintertime, some of these fish will be a little bit deeper. You might want to throw a heavier uh, spinner bait. That's something that, um, you know, I've had a lot of success on, especially on lakes like Cedar Creek Lake. They love a spinnerbait. Uh, a lot of these lakes that have a lot of shad, um, spinnerbait's really a good way to go. And, and like I said, this is something that you can use all year round. Uh, in the spring when they're up chasing, uh, they're getting ready to go on beds. Spinnerbait's an excellent, excellent tool uh, just to go down the bank and search uh, and figure out where those fish are located. Even after the spawn, once those fish are done and they kind of move out on structure like brush piles and grass beds, uh, you can pretty much find a spinnerbait tied, tied on one of my rods year round, uh, even into the fall. This is, this is one of those baits you really want to keep tied on and keep handy. Uh, but it's a good springtime bait. Um, another kind of similar to a uh, spinnerbait in the spring is uh, a bladed jig. Um, this this is the Strike King Thunder Cricket, but uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the jackhammer and the, uh, all the different bladed jigs. Uh, these are really good for grass. Um, that, that's kind of what I like to use uh, in the grass. You can throw them on timber and rock and stuff, but uh, for me, if you're fishing grass, it's really, really hard to beat uh, a bladed jig. Um, last but not least for some of my springtime baits, uh, you're looking at a buzz bait. You know, once that water starts getting up into the upper 50s, uh, some people throw them in a little bit cooler water, but uh, some of those upper 50 degrees, um, shallow, you know, right when those fish are coming up to spawn, uh, a buzz bait can catch some of the biggest fish in the lake uh, right before they come up to, to nest. Uh, and that's something you can extend out in the summertime too. You can always throw uh, buzz baits deep into the summer. Um, but that's a great springtime bait, especially right now, you know, as that water's starting to warm up. But uh, that's some of my springtime uh, hard baits right here. I don't know if you guys have any questions coming through about any of these. 
Um, if not, we can go on and talk about some soft plastics. And if you like, actually, before I move on to soft plastics, I can tell you about some, uh, just some line choices and some rigging options uh, for some of these. Uh, for these crankbaits and things with treble hooks, uh, the jerk bait, the lipless crankbait, the square bill, um, just any of these crankbaits, hard baits with treble hooks. Um, I don't, I don't really get too caught up in the power of a rod. You know, whether you're talking medium heavy or heavy, uh, you know, different powers. I don't really get too caught up in that. I think the most important thing when you're throwing treble hooked baits uh, is to think about the action. Uh, you know, whether it's a fast or extra fast or or moderate fast. Uh, and for me, when you're dealing with treble hook baits, I like to deal with uh, moderate actions. You know, I, I try to stay away from the fast actions, definitely stay away from the extra fast. Um, and that's really just talking about how stiff uh, these rods are. You know, the stiffer the rod, the faster the action. Uh, and, and I definitely don't want a stiff rod when I'm throwing these treble hook baits. Uh, what, what ends up happening with a stiff rod is you will pull these treble hooks out of the fish's mouth. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but there's not a real wide gap on that. And so these treble hooks are really just hooking uh, parts inside the, that fish's mouth. Um, you know, and some of that can be soft, it can be skin hooked uh, inside the mouth, and you don't want a real stiff rod that's gonna jerk those hooks out. Um, another thing when you're dealing with some of these treble hook baits, especially the jerk bait, uh, and, and this uh, uh, shad wrap here is you want to use a little bit lighter line. Uh, you know, I'll use 10 to 12 pound uh, fluorocarbon line. And what that does is that allows those baits to, to get down to the depths they're designed to get down to. Um, and the fluorocarbon allows, um, the, or kind of keeps the fish from being able to see the line really well. Um, you know, a lot of times you're throwing uh, these jerk baits in really clear water and you know these fish on Dale Hollow and, and Cumberland and some of these lakes with really clear water uh, they see a lot of these baits you know these these are pretty common baits that they see a lot of and if they see a if they see that line on there uh, they get what's called line shy and so uh, I like to go as light as possible on some of these uh, especially jerk bait and the shad wrap uh, it'll just increase your, your hookup ratio. Uh, you'll, you'll get more bites by using lighter line. Um, now for the spinner bait and the bladed jig, um, you know, I'll step it up a little bit. I'll go 14, maybe even the 16 pound test line because uh, these are just baits that are thrown in heavier cover, uh, dirtier water, and the, uh, you know, your line diameter doesn't matter as much uh, when you're throwing those kind of conditions. Um, for buzz baits and top water, uh, really all top water, I like to throw braided line, um, just for the sole reason of, uh, I'm not really worried about my, my line diameter at all, uh, with top water. Those fish are never going to see that line. And, uh, typically I'm fishing heavy cover, uh, when I'm throwing top water, you know, grass mats, uh, laid down trees, brush piles, that kind of stuff. So, uh, with buzz baits and any other kind of top water, I'm pretty much throwing heavy line uh, braid 99% of the time. But uh, that's kind of my spring rundown of some of my hard baits uh, and just some of my personal favorites. I think uh, pretty sure I've caught some really big fish on all of these baits out here on the table. Um, you know, I've, I've done well with all of these at uh, Cedar Creek, Kentucky Lake, Dale Hollow, Cumberland. I've, I've caught some big fish on all these baits. Um, one of the biggest fish I ever caught actually was caught on a spinner bait, uh, just like this on, uh, on Cumberland. Uh, it was a really big large mouth on Cumberland on a spinner bait this time of year too. I believe it was, uh, late March. So these are some definite, uh, definite springtime players here in Kentucky. And, uh, unless we have any questions, I'll go on and talk about some soft plastics that I like this time of year. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So we had a question from the chat. It says, uh, do fish see in two dimensions or three dimensions? Also, do they see color or just bright flashes from the sun reflection? Or do they react strictly to the vibration from the baits? I got you. So part of that question was, do the, do the fish see in 3D? Is that, was that part of the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, I'm not a biologist, but I'm pretty sure that they can definitely see uh, shapes. And, you know, they live in a 3D world just like we do. Um, they can definitely see color. Uh, as far as how much range of color they can see, it's hard to say. Uh, my thought process on all that is I like to keep my colors natural. Um, now, you will see a little bit of bright chartreuse like that and some reds like that. Um, but really, even under muddy conditions, I mean, these fish are feeding primarily on shad and um, crawfish. And even with muddy water, the shad doesn't change its color. You know, so those fish are still going to be feeding uh, on natural colored uh, you know, baits and lures. So uh, I don't know how many times I've seen a, a real chartreuse uh, bait fish swimming around. It's, it's not often, if ever. But, uh, you know, there are times where bright colors just get their attention, uh, whether it's in muddy water or, or, uh, or whether it's even clear uh, with these reds. Um, you know, that, that stuff is more or less an attention getter, uh, and it just makes those fish make a decision. You know, that, that's what we call the reaction strike. Um, another part of that question was asking about, you know, the fish, do they feel? And yes, uh, they definitely can feel the vibration of, of these lures along with seeing them. Um, you know, those, a lot of these fish, you know, all the fish that I fish for, bass in particular, uh, they've got what's called a lateral line. And that lateral line can, can pick up actual vibrations through the water. And that's where, you know, baits like the bladed jig come in handy, uh, the spinner bait, uh, even this lipless crankbait. You know, a lot of the bites that you get on those kinds of baits uh, are simply because the fish felt the vibration uh, on their lateral lines. Um, I remember one time I, I was actually at Cedar Creek Lake and I saw a fish that was acting really weird, uh, kind of close to the surface on a grass bed. And the fish was actually blind. Uh, it something that happened to its eyes and you could see it plain as day in the water that, that it was completely blind. And I started kind of messing with it. I was throwing a bladed jig and I would rip that bladed jig right by it. And you could tell when that jig would come by that fish's side, he would dart and react to it. But it was only after he felt it go by and that was that fish's lateral line picking up those vibrations in the water. So, uh, you know, these fish are definitely uh, visual feeders uh, and they're also uh, reacting to those vibrations in the water. So it's a good question. Uh, yes, I will confirm fish do see in three dimensions and they do see color um, and the vibrations on their lateral lines is correct as well. Uh, for me, color to me is strictly just to get contrast to the water. Now I stick with natural colors myself, but usually these brighter colors are thrown in less visual conditions for the fish. So it just mostly gets their attention. That's why black and blue works really well in muddy water. It's just that good contrast color so they can actually see it. It's not so much that you can throw black and blue super clear water and it still work. It's just a little bit more effective. It's most of the contrast is what I look for. Yeah, for sure. You definitely want to give them, you know, and that's kind of, kind of like the idea of at nighttime, uh, people throw really dark color, you know, like dark jigs and dark spinner baits. And the whole point of that is just to give a contrast. Uh, you know, if those fish can see the outline of that profile of that bait, uh, it just gives them something to actually hone in on and kind of attack. So color, I don't think is as important as creating that contrast. So if there's no more questions, I'm gonna kind of pull these baits out of here and uh, we'll talk about some soft plastics. There we go, don't wanna... Well, you know, if you've done much fishing, you've probably heard of the Yamamoto Senko. Um, not sure that any bait ever invented has caught more fish than probably a Senko. Wouldn't you think so? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's just a crazy fish catching bait. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I don't I don't throw the Senko a whole lot until the spawn. Um, once these fish start going on the bed, 
uh, that's when you'll see uh, the Senko really start to play. Uh, it's just got such a good action, and it's really versatile. I mean, you can fish this in so many different ways. Um, you know, a lot of people wacky rig uh, a Senko where they just put a hook in through the middle. Um, there's other things that you can do. You can Texas rig it. Uh, and I'll show you real quick just uh, how to Texas rig. I've got an offset EWG uh, worm hook right here. It's a little rusty. It's one of my poor uh, hooks. Can y'all see that fairly well? Okay. So I'm just going to show you real quick. Uh, this is what's called Texas rigging. Um, and what I like to do is I'll take the hook, push it through the head of the worm, keeping it straight until I hit that bend. If you look, that bend in that hook, just push it to, through till you hit that bend. And then I'll like to push it through, slide the worm up onto the shank, go up until you hit that bend and give that hook just a little twist, pull it through until it comes up on that, on that shoulder. And then I'll kind of line up the, uh, the hook point with the bait kind of keeping it straight. Pull it through, and this is, uh, this is a little thing they call tech exposing, where the hook's actually exposed, but what we'll do is we'll take the hook point and kind of bury it in the plastic a little bit, and then that creates a nice, even, evenly rigged on the hook. Now, you can fish this weightless just like this, and that's a great way to slip that worm into a bass's bed. Uh, you know, under some tree limbs. This is really nice to skip underneath boat docks. Uh, if, if you're fishing a lot of docks, you can put weight on it and fish it deeper. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways that you can fish this bait. And I'm telling you, <laughs> this Yamamoto Senko is responsible for so many uh, fish catches and, and not just catching a lot of numbers, uh, but these things catch some really, really big fish. Uh, this is one of those baits that once the spawn hits, um, this is a bait that you can go around and throw anywhere in this state. Uh, and, and honestly, you've got a chance to catch a trophy bass just on that right there. Um, the, there's something about the action of it. You know, it doesn't look like much. It's just a solid piece of plastic. There's no curly tail. Uh, there's no appendages. It's just a really simple, uh, simple bait to go out and throw. Um, you could go out to Cedar Creek Lake and throw this all year round, uh, basically from March until uh, up into November, and you will absolutely get bit on that. Um, no matter where you go in this state, this is a staple uh, to having your tackle box for sure. So I'll make a comment here that this is not the only brand that will work like this. For sure. Like for Yum sure. makes their version called the Deer. It's yeah. basically just a stick worm is the best way. Lots of different brands make them, but the Cinco is the one that gave the name to that style. So you'll hear people say, oh, I was throwing a Cinco when they might've been throwing a Yum brand bait. They right. just, the name stuck, so. Yeah, it's it's kind of the classic. Um, you know, there's also, uh, I think Berkeley makes the general, um, You've already mentioned the Yum Dinger. Uh, basically, every brand of soft plastic has their version of this soft plastic stick bait. Um, another one of my favorite baits uh, to use this time of year uh, is a flute style. Um, I'm partial to the uh, to the caffeine chad. It's made by Strike King, um, but this is basically just a uh, it's a jerk bait, um, but it's a soft jerk bait. Uh, it it kind of floats and it kind of sinks. It, it's got a real interesting uh, neutral buoyancy to it. Uh, what I like about the caffeine shad is it does uh, have a little bit of weight to it. It's, it's not super light and it's got a slow sink to it and it's just got such a really good action. Uh, but I'll use the same hook that I used on the, on the uh, stick bait. I'll use the exact same hook, rig it the same way and um, this is great to jerk around on uh, grass, docks, uh, beds. This is a gr another great uh, bait to throw uh, when the fish are up on the beds. Uh, but this is something that'll excel from uh, when the fish go to spawn all the way through fall until, uh, until the water temperatures get back down into the low 50s. Um, but this is such a good fish catcher around here. 
Um, I do like the pearl white, especially when they're on the beds. Uh, once they come off the beds, I'll switch over to a green pumpkin, uh, just kind of mimic a bluegill, uh, something like that. But um, really good on grassy lakes. These are excellent uh, to throw in the grass. Uh, one of my favorite things about this bait is that when the fish do eat it, I would say 80% of the time you get to see it. It's almost like a topwater bite. Um, you know, I, I love watching fish come out of the grass and uh, eat these things, but they, uh, when they commit to it, it, it's a visual kind of bite. It's something that you'll get to see. Uh, so it's a lot of fun to throw that. Yep. Okay, so we got a question in the chat. It's, uh, do these baits have scent? That's a good question. Uh, some of them do and some of them don't. Uh, the caffeine shad definitely does. It's got kind of a coffee scent to it. Um, you know, bass have uh, what's called olfactory system. Uh, just like we have for our nose, they have, um, I'm not going to say it's the same thing, but it's similar. Um, I think studies have shown that they can detect scent. You know, I think for a lot of years, people always like to think that scent kind of caught the fishermen and not the fish. But, um, you know, there have been some studies that fish can detect uh, scent in the water. Uh, I personally like to use scent on some of my soft plastics. Um, I keep uh, bottles of, uh, it's called JB's Fish Sauce. And it's uh, typically a crawfish scent is what I like. Uh, but it's made out of 100% crawfish oil. Um, and, and I do like to put scent on a lot of my baits. Uh, you know, you'll see garlic scents, uh, coffee scents, bait fish, craw. Uh, there's a lot of different scents out there, but um, I think it makes a difference. I really do. And for whatever reason, I don't have any uh, scientific facts to back it up. But for some reason, I get the feeling that smallmouth can detect the scent better than largemouth. I don't know why that I think that, but just some of my experiences uh, out on Cumberland and, and Dale Hollow with smallmouth lends me to believe for some reason they can pick up scent better. I it could be all in my head, um, but I just get that feeling. <laughs> um, another classic soft plastic to use. This is kind of leading into more summertime, um, more of a summertime bait, but it's just your classic, um, you know, Zoom's just one of the all-time classic brands, um, but just a classic seven inch curly tail worm. Um, it, it's really hard to beat. Uh, it provides kind of a, it looks like a big bait, like you would uh, only catch big fish on that, but I've seen some of the smallest fish in the lake get these big worms and, and get them down. Um, this is something that I like to throw once the fish have come off the beds uh, and they've kind of moved out to maybe some deeper water. They're holding on some kind of cover, uh, especially lay down trees and brush piles. That's when you can Texas rig these worms and um, you know fish them out deep and you know a lot of times these fish when they're done spawning they're looking for a big easy meal something they don't have to work too hard for uh, and a big slow moving worm just uh, provides them that opportunity and I always wondered you know what is it about a worm that you know what does the bass really think that is and um, a few years ago I was fishing Kentucky Lake and I finally understood uh, what it is these fish think these worms are, at least what I think. Um, and that's where I discovered a lamprey. I don't know if, uh, are you familiar with the lamprey, Andrew? It's, um, the lamprey is basically like a freshwater eel uh, is kind of the best way I know to describe it. And it, it looks almost like a snake or an eel. And they actually attach themselves to bass. I've caught some big bass, uh, especially on Kentucky Lake. And they'll have these big lampreys that are attached uh, to the bass. And I swear they look just like these uh, seven and even 10 inch worms. Uh, but uh, these worms and these soft plastics, uh, really, really great baits to throw in the spring going into the summer, especially once the fish have come off the beds. That's when I feel like these uh, soft plastics really start to shine. Any questions on soft plastics or anything?
You know, uh, in the spring, um, another good soft plastic bait to throw is going to be uh, just a classic little swim bait. Uh, these, you know, these fish are starting to get out and get active. The water's starting to warm up, and uh, those fish will start chasing bait. Um, this is something that that you can throw from spring all the way through, really all the way through winter. I mean, a swim bait is something you can throw year round. Uh, this is a 4.3 inch swim bait from Kitek. Uh, they make sizes all the way down from two inches all the way up to eight inches. I mean, they they really run the 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 gamut of sizes. The 4.3's kind of been my mainstay. That's such a good bait fish size, uh, especially for Kentucky. It looks like a you know either a big thread fin or a small gizzard shad, uh, and that's a great great bait to throw. Uh, especially once uh, once that water warms up a little bit in the spring, uh, you can really you can run through boxes of these swim baits. Um, you can rig them a lot of different ways. You can rig them weedless, uh, which is kind of what we've done here. You rig them Texas rig uh, with you know with a little weight on there. You can rig them weedless that way, or you can run a jig head and, and have the hook actually exposed. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that that you can fish that, and it really just depends on what kind of cover. You're dealing with if you're in uh, grassy uh, lakes like Dale Hollow or Cedar Creek or you know wherever if you're dealing with a lot of grass you might want to go with a weedless presentation uh, if you're in open water like Cumberland or Laurel or you know something like that you might want to go with an exposed hook uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can fish that but uh, you know swim bait's definitely a, a good option uh, from spring leading into summer Trying to think if I have any more little soft plastics. Uh, you know, one of the new one of the new baits that uh, well, it's not really new, but uh, they've been popular the last few years is a Ned rig. Uh, this is one of my favorites, made by Robo Worm, and it's just a really small uh, piece of soft plastic. Really, it's really similar to a stick bait. It's just really really small and. Uh, People just rig up a bare jig head to that. And that, have you thrown the Ned rig much, Andrew? I have not. It's one of those I'm going to spend all my gift cards on this year. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those baits. If if you struggle to catch fish, if you've tried a lot of different things and it's just not working for you, this is a great place to start. Um, it's great for beginners. If the bite is really tough, like if you're in a cold front and – the fish are just not active. This is one of those little, it's just a little snack for these bats. You know, sometimes you're not super hungry, but you want a little something. Uh, that's kind of what this is to these bats. Uh, they may not be in a mood to eat uh, or, you know, whatever. Fishing could just be tough. But for whatever reason, this bait right here catches a ton of fish. And I'm looking around. I don't know if I actually brought a Ned uh ned head or not i don't think i did but they're marketed and sold as a ned head or a ned rig and it's just a small jig head that these soft plastics go on um but these are great baits to throw i like throwing them in rocky uh rocky conditions or not conditions but rocky environments uh they're good around docks and, and it's really just uh it's a finesse presentation you know it's something you're going to want to throw on a spinning rod with, uh, you know, eight pound test, maybe even lighter than that. I probably wouldn't go over 10, uh, but eight to 10 pound test on a finesse spinning reel. And uh, that right there will get you bit when nothing else will. Uh, so if you're having trouble out there catching fish, start with the Ned rig and work your way from there, go to a Senko and then you can kind of progress through. But the Ned rig is, is also one of my favorite baits to throw. Uh, in, in the summertime, especially when it's when it's hot and the bite gets kind of tough uh, or even in the fall when the bait is fairly small and um, just really under tough, tough conditions. That's when this Ned rig is going to shine. Um, but I really like throwing it on hard, hard su uh, surfaces like rocks, docks, um, even boat ramps. Boat ramps are a good place to throw a Ned rig. There's always fish hanging around boat ramps. But um, that's uh, that's about all I've got on the soft plastics. Yeah.
Yeah, I do have some creeping roots. While he's getting that out, we do have a question. It says, in moving water like the rivers, will you use some baits over others or just add more weight? That's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, in moving waters, um, you can you can just add more weight. Um, there are some different baits that you can throw in moving water. I like to throw jigs uh, and little small spinner baits, actually, uh, like Elkhorn Creek, for example. It's really hard to beat a little three sixteenths uh, jig, three sixteenths ounce jig. Um, little small quarter ounce spinner baits, uh, small top waters. Uh, but if you want to fish on the bottom and you're in really swift current, uh, you know you can definitely up your uh, up your weight, and, and that'll help keep you, your bait on the bottom. Uh, but I've always found whenever I try to up my weight in heavy flows, I always end up getting hung up. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's it, extra weight's not always the answer. Um, little finesse jigs has always been my go-to when it comes to flows. That's a good question. Um, moving on to a couple other soft plastics. Um, this is one of my favorites from missile baits. It's, it's called a D bomb. Uh, and it's really just a, what they call a beaver style bait. Uh, that's good. You can put that on the back of a jig as a jig trailer. Uh, I did bring, uh, brought one of my favorite jigs that I like to throw on Del Hollow. It's a big football jig. Uh, that's kind of moving into the summertime stuff. Uh, you know, coming off the, the, the spawn and those fish are starting to move out deep, um, you know, and they kind of go back to feeding on crawls. But uh, big football jig, also a great year-round bait. That's something you can throw all year. But uh, these beaver-style baits, if you notice, there's really not much to them. They're, they're kind of meant to mimic a crawfish. You know, they've got these two big appendages here. Um, you know, they've got them with appendages all up and down. Uh, they really come in many different shapes and sizes, but uh, this general outline is what's considered a, a beaver style bait uh, or a jig trailer. You could you could always trim it down and and put it on the back of a jig. Uh, and then, kind of expanding out from the beaver style, is uh, what we call a creature bait. Uh, and if, if you can see it, I'll kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so you can see. But you can kind of see the transition of. A, a beaver style bait to what we call a creature bait. And it's got this really long, uh, these long twin tails on it. Almost looks like a worm, um, but it's just a creature bait. It's kind of a blend between a beaver and a worm. Uh, those are great to throw in the summertime uh, when those fish get out on points and they're on deeper structure. Uh, you can Texas rig that. You can do what's called a Carolina rig. I uh, didn't bring all my rods and reels and stuff to get into too much about Carolina rigs and Texas rigs and all that. But uh, yeah. these are really good baits to Texas rig or Carolina rig, either one. Uh, but these are baits I like to throw uh, once the spawn's over. You know, you're talking June, July, August, September, uh, even into October. These creature baits can really, uh, you can really catch a lot of big fish on these. Uh, but it's just something I like to fish deep and slow. Uh, like I said, once that spawns over, those fish are really looking for, um, you know, slow, big meals, something that's easy that they can get a hold of. It's not moving too fast. It's not, uh, you know, doing a whole lot of action. It's just an easy, quick meal that they can get. Uh, but this D-bomb is probably, if I had to pick one bait to fish with for the rest of my life, it would probably be a Texas rig D bomb. Um, I, I'll go out and from March all the way through November, and I'll throw those kind of baits right there. Uh, definitely some of my favorite favorite styles of baits to throw. They're just so versatile. You know, you can. I've seen guys drop shot these. Um, you know, like I said, jig trailers, Texas rigs, Carolina rigs. You, you can do so much with these baits right here. Uh, it's pro probably my all time favorite. see moving on so we're kind of in that summertime uh summertime pattern i'll, I'll get out one of the uh one of the all-time greats for summertime fishing is a deep diving crankbait um you know we talked about some of the spring crankbaits and you'll notice 
uh, they had a lot smaller bills. You know, you can see that it's got a really big bill on it. Uh, that's going to dive down depending on how heavy your line is. Uh, you know, if you're throwing this on 12 pound test fluorocarbon, you know, you're going to be able to get this bait down close to 20 feet deep. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much reserved for uh, summertime fishing. You know, that's June, July, August, September. That's when these deep diving crankbaits uh, really shine through. And, and basically what happens, you know, I, I tend to think about Kentucky Lake when I think about deep diving crankbaits. And, you know, I kind of think about Kevin Van Dam and what he would do. And they would go out on those river ledges and those bars and points. And uh, those schools of fish would get really deep uh, on schools of bait fish. And so that's what they're doing. They're kind of feeding on that bait in really deep water. And uh, these deep diving crankbaits, that's about the only way you can get down there, uh, you know, to get some of those fish to eat. But uh, that's a great summertime lure if you're not wanting to throw soft plastics or, you know, you're wanting to kind of throw something moving uh, in deeper water. That's a great choice right there, along with, you know, some of the bigger Kitek swim baits that we talked about. But uh, as far as hard baits go in the summertime, that right there is, is a great, great choice. Uh, I see guys on Cedar Creek Lake throwing, you know, big deep diving crankbaits with a lot of success. Uh, you know, once June hits, water starts getting pretty hot. Uh, it's, a, it's a great choice. Hmm. Another little bait that we haven't really talked about, uh, and this kind of kicks up, uh, you know, some guys throw them in the spring. Uh, I like to wait until, you know, about July when that water starts really getting hot and some of those grass mats start getting thick is a frog. Uh, it's just a topwater frog. This is made by Spro. Um, a lot of times I like to trim these legs. You know, a lot of times they come a little too much leg on the back. And, and what ends up happening with these longer legs, we, if you don't trim them, is the bass will actually come up and hit these legs and they'll completely miss the frog. Uh, so I like to trim these legs down a little bit just to give them a little bit smaller target. But uh, these frogs are great to throw all the way. They really do best in the fall, uh, October and November. But, uh, you know, they're, they're still great to throw July, August, September. Uh, this is really a bait July through November uh, that they really do well on. Uh, throw them on Cedar Creek, uh, basically any lake that's got grass. Uh, if you've got grass or algae uh, or any kind of growth on the surface, that's when these frogs are really, really going to uh, do well for you. Some of the biggest fish in the lake, too, will eat a frog. Uh, usually when I catch one on a frog, it's a big one. I don't necessarily get a ton of bites on frogs, but uh, usually the big ones are the ones that eat, uh, eat on that. Now, I will throw a very long and heavy stiff rod when I'm throwing a frog. Um, you know, that's where I throw kind of the heaviest, heaviest rod I've got. Um, you know, you want an extra fast action. Uh, I'm throwing that on a seven foot three, seven foot four rod, uh, extra heavy, throwing 65 pound test braid. Uh, so this is kind of heavy tackle right here. Um, sorry if you guys hear some noise, they're doing some construction next door. Uh, got me a little distracted, but uh, but these frogs are really great uh, fishing vegetation. That's really where they shine. Um, summer through fall. That's that's another great choice to throw here in Kentucky. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about some top waters. This is a little top water from Rapala. Uh, it's got a little blade on the back, kind of reminds me of a devil's horse. But uh, once that spawns over with, and even really during the spawn, you, sometimes you can get some of these fish to commit uh, to, to eating a top water. But um, definitely once the spawn is over, once that water temperature, you know, gets into that mid 60, 65 degrees and up, uh, that top water bite will start. Uh, you know, shad will spawn around 70 degrees. So once you get 65 to 70 degrees, that's really your prime time, uh, top water feeding time. Um, you, 
you know, you, you've got different styles of top waters. You know, we talked about some frogs. Um, this is just a little surface lure with a prop. You've got spooks that are made by uh, Hedden. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, of course, you've got the Whopper Plopper. That's another awesome top water bait. I don't think I brought any Whopper Ploppers. Uh, I'm looking around to see what we got. I don't know if you guys are familiar <clears throat> with a Whopper Plopper or not. I think Andrew's trying to find me a Whopper Plopper to show you guys. You don't? No. That's okay. You guys can look up a Whopper Plopper. Uh, it's a great summertime uh, top water bait. Uh, it's another one of those deals anytime the spawn's done. Um, you know, and any, any, any of these top water baits are great early in the morning, late in the evening under low light conditions. Uh, anytime from May until, well, really April, depending on what part of the state, but April all the way through November is a great time to throw top water. Um, I, I usually reserve top water for the first few hours in the morning and the last few hours in the evening. It's a, it's a good way to fool a big one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's all right. But, um, you know, with a lot of these top water baits, uh, one of the more important things uh, with pretty much all top waters is don't use fluorocarbon line for your top waters. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing to, to remember uh, about top water. Uh, fluorocarbon line sinks. And so what will end up happening is uh, you've got fluorocarbon line on the end. It'll pull the nose down as that line sinks. Uh, and you really won't be able to work those baits the way you need to. They just won't react right. So what I, what I typically throw is braid. Uh, I'll throw braided line for all of my top water. Uh, but you can get away with monofilament as well. Uh, mono doesn't tend to sink. It's got more of a buoyant properties to it. <clears throat> so use mono or braid for your top water baits. Never use fluorocarbon uh, for your top waters. But um, top water really for me is one of those things that does really well during the shad spawn. Uh, that usually happens in May. Uh, once the water temperature hits about 70, 72 two degrees your shad are going to start spawning um, and th that'll be a, a early in the morning and late in the evening kind of bite uh, but top water is probably one of the more fun bites that you can get on uh, there's nothing better than watching a fish come up and and bust something on top it's it's uh it's one of the more thrilling bites you can have in fishing uh, so if you get somebody that's never been fishing before and you kind of want to get them hooked like your wife or your girlfriend or, you know, a kid or something that you, you just really want them to experience, uh, you know, the adrenaline of, of catching a bass, get them on a topwater bait. That's, that's one of the absolute funnest ways to catch them. I have a question for you. Yeah. What style of retrieve would you use for a topwater? Are you just reeling it straight back? Or are you doing what they call walking dog? Yeah, so each different bait has, uh, you know, different uh, styles of retrieve. Uh, whopper ploppers and buzz baits, you know, is more of a straight retrieve. Uh, with, you know, you can build in some pauses. Uh, if you're throwing a stick bait, like what we just had out here, the get it back out. If you're throwing a bait like this, it's kind of a jerk, jerk pause, uh, or even a walk the dog style, which is um, a series of twitches with your wrist and your rod tip. Uh, not necessarily a straight retrieve. Um, same goes with a popper. Uh, with a popper, it's kind of a, you almost work it like you do a jerk bait. It's pop, pop, and then pause. Uh, you know, give it a couple jerks and then let it pause and sit. Uh, a lot of times with a popper, especially, I'll have fish come up and eat it while it's just sitting still. Uh, you won't even be moving it at all. And that's when they'll come up and hit it. So especially with a popper, I like to give a, you know, a two to three to four second pause and just give that fish a minute to look at it. And uh, a lot of times that, that fish will come up and hit on the pause. But uh, retrieve is really important, especially with topwater baits. Uh, a lot of times you just have to uh, experiment, you know, try pausing it longer, try giving it a couple different twitches and, uh, you know, you try different retrieves. But uh, typically your straight retrieves, like I said, buzz baits, whopper poppers that kind of stuff to straight retrieve and then everything else pretty much requires a 
you know, to develop a cadence uh, and a pattern to your, you know, to your action. Uh, but that's a good question. Uh, just everything does require a little bit different, uh, a little bit different retrieves. Okay. So now to build on that again, what about color for topwater baits? Yeah. Now topwater is one of those things where I think color really doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, I will say that on brighter, sunnier days, you might want to use more natural colors. Um, under cloudier conditions, I'll use darker colors, you know, like blacks. Um, black is really my favorite on cloudy days. Uh, and it goes back to what we were talking about it. You know, a black bait on the surface when it's cloudy provides a good contrast. Um, you know, under sunny conditions, you might use chrome. Uh, chrome's a good color to use on sunny conditions. And it just causes, um, it's all about reflection and contrast. So on those cloudy days, dark, dark style top waters make kind of an outline when that fish is looking up, uh, just gives them something to hone in on. Uh, and then under bright conditions, you give them something kind of flashy, kind of bright. Uh, and again, it just causes a reflection and gives that bass something to, to track and hone in on. So, but I will say, I, I do think out of every style of bait, I do think color matters least when it comes to top water. Um, you know, we talked about jigs a little bit, uh, talked about football jigs. Uh, here's a nice little swim jig. Uh, these kind of baits right here, that's more of a spring to summer, summertime kind of bait. And those are perfect if you have a grassy lake, uh, if you're fishing uh, hydrilla or reeds or any kind of grass, that's when these baits are really going to do well. Um, it's not so much of a feel, you know, it's not going to put out a ton of vibration. It's more of a, um, a visual kind of a thing. You want to fish it in clear water uh, around grass. A lot of these jigs have rattles built into them. I don't know if you guys can see that, uh, but there's these little rattle chambers. I don't know if you can hear that, but when you're swimming them through and they're, they're banging off of, uh, you know, rocks or lay downs or whatever, you get it hung up in some grass and give it a pop. Uh, those rattles are going to tend to, uh, you know, draw some fish in on that. But primarily these, uh, these swim jigs are, are good uh, under clear water grass and that's kind of a visual visual kind of bite right there um we did talk a little bit about um trying to find my football jig got it right here in front of me we did talk about jigs a little bit if there's one bait that i think you could fish year round no matter the water uh, temperature no matter the water color uh, no matter what phase of the spawn the fish are in is a jig. I think a jig is probably, um, it's just probably the most versatile bait that exists. Uh, if you're going to just go out with one bait uh, and try to catch some fish, it would either be a D-bomb or a jig or a jig with a D-bomb on it. <laughs> That's probably what I would choose. Um, but, you know, fish pretty much eat crawdads year round, except in the extreme parts of the winter, uh, crawdads are, are hibernating and aren't exactly out, um, but you can still catch fish on a jig, even in the winter time. But uh, a jig is one of the most versatile baits that exist in my opinion. And, um, you know, if, if you're wanting to start out with just a few baits, uh, a jig is definitely one of the few baits that you should definitely have uh, in your arsenal. So the question to go on top of this is, you can just see that jig he just moved doesn't have a trailer on it. Right. You don't fish a jig without a trailer. True. And True. how do you select your trailers for your jigs? That's a really good question. Um, I'm actually going to thread up a, uh, a trailer on here. So I'll show you a few different things. So if you notice the trailer on this swim jig, uh, it's got some, uh, some appendages on it that are, is kind of a crawfish looking uh, trailer. But this is actually a rage, uh, rage crawl. And it's kind of thick, and this actually, it, it paddles in the water. It makes a lot of movement, creates a lot of disturbance in the water. Uh, this D-bomb, if you were to use this as a jig trailer, it's not going to move that much water. 
you know, there's not a whole lot of action to it compared to, um, you know, the the ridges on this one, or even a, a swim bait trailer. And you see that boot tail, that's going to kick and create a whole lot of action. And so what I like to do is in the wintertime or in the early, early spring when the water's cold, kind of like it is now, uh, you know, it's March, uh, mid-March, the water's still kind of cold. I like to use a trailer that uh, doesn't provide a lot of motion. Uh, I don't want a lot of action right now. And if you think about it, that water's cold and a lot of the crawfish that are out, uh, they're still a little lethargic. You know, those, the, the bass are lethargic. Uh, they're, they're, there's not things out there swimming right now that are creating a whole lot of disturbance and making a whole lot of movement because it's cold. Uh, so when it's wintertime and springtime under cold water, I'll use baits like this that don't have as much action. Now, once that water warms up, say 60 degrees, 62 degrees, and starts moving up from there, that's when I'll bust out the trailers like this that move a lot of water, has a lot of action to it. Uh, you know, your twin tail grubs, your uh, rage crawls like this, you know, where, the, where it's thick, moves a lot of water. That's where you'll get into your boot tail swim baits that you can use. Uh, so basically the warmer the water, the more active your fish and your prey are going to be. And that's when you'll want to use more, uh, more uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, the more active baits, you know, it's got more action to the bait uh, versus things like this that are kind of, kind of playing kind of boring not really moving a lot of water uh just you know these are these are better in colder water conditions but uh i'll go ahead and rig up a jig right here uh, this is a yankum jig that's sold down around dale hollow uh, it's a really popular jig down there but i like to pull the uh pull the skirt material away from the the shaft of the hook take your bait and we'll thread it through it's a little messy sometimes, but just push that on through until you get to about the middle part of the bait. I'm kind of following. I can kind of feel the hook and feel where it's at on the bait. The important thing is just keeping it straight. So we've got it straight there. Shove that up on there. And sometimes it gets a little bunched up. You can kind of pull on it and get it straightened up, push it further up the bait there. Now that's a big jig. That's a big bait. Um, but you definitely don't want to throw a jig without a trailer on it. Um, this is something with this kind of bulky jig. Uh, that's, you know, football jigs great to throw in the summertime when those fish are deep or in the early spring when they're coming out of their wintertime, uh, wintertime holding areas and they're trying to move up uh, to those staging points and get ready to start spawning or think about getting shallow. Um, you know, these, these big bulky jigs like that, you know, that, that, that's how you catch a lot of your bigger fish, but uh, always put a trailer on your jigs and just try and match it to your uh, water temperatures. You know, the warmer it gets, the more action you want your jig, the colder it gets, the, the less action you want. So um, the next million dollar question, and I can see that you've matched this color here. And I hear this a lot from people is, do you want your trailer to match the color of your jig? Or do you want contrast or does it matter? I personally like to match. Um, you know, I, it's probably more of a personal confidence kind of a thing, but I just think it looks natural. Uh, and that's really what I'm going for a lot of times. You know, you can see with this swim jig, you've got a white jig with a green pumpkin trailer, um, you know, and that creates a little bit more contrast. Um, you know, it really just depends on what you're going for, uh, what your water temperature looks like. I like, uh, I like to match though. I just think it gives it a, a natural appearance, uh, kind of blends well. Um, just really natural is what I'm going for 99% of the time. Um, you know, if you've got really muddy water and you need something to stand out, that's when you would use, you know, maybe a, a, a something with a blue or a, some bright chartreuse or something. Now, if you look at the backside of this jig, there is a few strands of chartreuse in there uh and, and that's always good to add you know little accents of color and you can utilize that in your jig trailer too uh you know if you're dealing with muddy water or stained water uh, and you want to get a little bit of contrast in there 
that's a good time to do that with your uh, with your jig trailers. Uh, another good technique to do, uh, just to add a little bit of accent color, is you can dye the tips of your uh, pinchers with a little bit of chartreuse or a little bit of red. Uh, there's spike it out there dye that you can dye the tips. They make a little marker where you can uh, you can dye the tips of your soft plastics chartreuse or different colors, uh, and you know that that just gives those fish a little something to get their attention. A uh, little bit of brightness in there, maybe reflect a little bit more light. Uh, it's just an attention getter, uh, especially especially good under muddy or stained conditions. But 99% uh, of the time, I'm trying to get this to look as close to a crawfish as possible and just keep it natural. So that's my rundown on some jigs. Got any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or type it in the chat. We'll definitely ask them out loud. If not, I was going to go into some situations that most anglers will run into. And then I especially wanted to focus on those of us who are not fortunate enough to be able to afford boats that fish from the bank. So obviously, I don't think a deep diving crankbait is going to be the most practical thing for a bank angler. Right. So we'll throw a situation at Jay and see what he would do. So say he's at the local lake, which we'll say will be Giss Creek Lake, and he's fishing from the bank at the public access spot, and he's got some rocks out in front of him and some trees on one side and like a dirt bank on the other side. So like, how would you approach that and what kind of baits would you throw? We'll say it's summertime. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, like you said, uh, a, a crankbait that's going to dive down 20 feet is probably not your ideal choice uh, for fishing from the bank. What I would do if I was fishing from the bank is I would probably stick to soft plastics. Uh, soft plastics tend to work better in shallower water. Uh, considering you're on the bank, the odds of you being able to get out to ultra deep water uh, aren't that great. You know, you're typically going to be fishing uh, 10 to 12 feet or, or shallower. And so I would probably throw a, uh, a Texas rig Cinco uh, or a Texas rig D-bomb. Uh, something soft plastic that you can kind of work uh, around the timber, around those rocks, uh, you know, something like that. Now, if it were later in the evening um, or earlier in the morning, I would maybe throw top water until the sun uh, either came up or, uh, or went down. But um, you know, if you're fishing lower light conditions, a uh, spinnerbait would be a good choice or a bladed jig. But uh, I have to say, I think my go-to would probably be a Cinco uh, or a D-Bomb or a Beaver style bait. Doesn't have to be a D-Bomb brand, but, uh, you know, probably a Beaver style bait Texas rig or a uh, weightless Cinco would probably be the way to go if I was bank fishing. Okay, so another scenario, and if anybody has any questions, just chime on in. I'm just trying to work a, work Jay over and get all his knowledge out of him I can. So I fish Green River some, and we've got big bluff rock walls. What would you dissect those with, essentially? What kind of baits would you try? Yeah, uh, bluff walls uh, can be really, really good, uh, especially in the spring. Uh, that's probably where you're going to want to get a, a jig out or that Ned rig. Uh, you know, another bait that we really didn't talk about is a shaky head. Uh, and that's really just a, a plus size Ned rig is really all a shaky head is. Um, but that's where I would think you want to fish some of the bottom, uh, unless it's really early in the year and those bluffs can be really good, uh, with a, with a jerk bait. So if your water temperatures are, um, you know, under 60 degrees, I would say uh, a crankbait or a jerk bait would be good. If you're over 60 degrees, I would say that's a good time to bust the jig uh, and or the Ned rig out. Uh, that that would probably be my guess on on Green River on those bluffs. And now, say you're fishing the local creek, so I would say Elkhorn Creek, mm -hmm. where we're at currently. What would be your bait choices to take out? Because sometimes you can't tell the conditions of the creek until you're standing in the water. So what yeah. would you take with you generally? Uh, you know, if I'm going to Elkhorn Creek, I, I'm definitely going to have a box full of 316ths, uh, just some green pumpkin jigs. 
uh, maybe a little bit of orange in there. Some of the crawfish out there tend to have a lot of orange in them. Um, again, a Senko. Uh, this is a five inch Senko. I may downsize and go to a four, uh, but a Senko, a jig, uh, you definitely got to have a top water and probably a small spinner bait. Uh, and I think out of those baits right there, uh, you should definitely be able to catch fish on Elkhorn Creek. Uh, my number one bait out there, though, it's got to be a 3 sixteenths green pumpkin jig with a little bit of orange. I think that's, that's your money bait on Elkhorn, whether it's clear or whether it's muddy. Um, that, that bait, for whatever reason, they, they just, those fish live on crawfish out there. And so that, that kind of jig, that size, that color, I think it just really mimics what they what they eat most. <clears throat> so if I'm going to Elkhorn Creek or any creek that has crawfish, uh, three sixteenths ounce jig probably going to be the way to go. I would also throw in a uh, creature bait that looks like a lizard is always very yep. popular. I have a lot of luck with that on the creek as well. Yeah, I know we've uh, we've gone out there in years past and thrown a a four inch zoom lizard. And you can catch as many as, as long as you've got bags of lizards on hand, <laughs> you can go through them. They love them, especially before the spawn. Um, there's something, you know, those lizards kind of look like salamanders and salamanders are notorious for robbing uh, the beds of bass. Uh, they'll eat the eggs. And so bass have a natural uh, tendency to go after the lizards. Uh, especially during the spawn, March, April, May, those months, especially uh, a creature bait like what we showed before, um, you know, like this right here, uh, or or just a, a lizard, a uh, salamander, you know, from Zoom, the Zoom four inch lizard. Uh, that's a great, great option to throw uh, in the creeks. Uh, there's always salamanders in the creeks uh, or anytime during the spawn, uh, the, those lizards and salamanders there's something about it that those fish, they, uh, it's a natural instinct to protect their bed uh, from those salamanders. So that's a great, great bait to throw. And then our last scenario, since we all can't make it to the big lakes and rivers and creeks, is what about small ponds? What yeah. Well, I grew up fishing ponds. You know, ponds are great, uh, great places to start because they're just, there are many lakes. You know, you can kind of do so much. Uh, you know, I've seen some great frog fishing on ponds, especially the ponds that have a lot of grass in them. And, you know, a lot of these ponds, especially in the summertime, they'll get kind of overgrown. There'll be some algae and stuff. And they tend to get hard to fish later in the year because of that. Uh, and that's where a frog can really, really do well on these ponds. Uh, earlier in the year, you know, like we are now, I think on a, on a pond, it's really hard to beat a medium size uh, spinner bait, you know, a quarter ounce, five sixteenths. You could even go up to a half ounce uh, spinner bait on a lot of these ponds. Uh, and those are going to get bit, um, you know, square bill crankbaits are really good to throw on ponds, especially if you're fishing from the bank uh, because they don't dive too deep. You know, they're only going down four or five feet at the deepest. Uh, so square bill crankbait, uh, spinner bait, topwater frog, uh, and then, of course, you got to have a Cinco and a D-bomb. Uh, you go out there and cover those bottom depths, too. Uh, and that right there, you know, that'd be a great little pond kit uh, that you could put together is a few bags of uh, soft plastic stick baits, a few beaver-style baits, some spinner baits, frogs, and a couple square bill crank baits. And I'd say you're set to, to catch some fish on any farm pond in Kentucky. Okay, so that's all the situational stuff I have, but now... Kind of an interesting question I just thought of when I was thinking about this. So say I'm fishing my brand new crankbait and I get hung mm -hmm. on rocks or trees or anything. What are some tips to get that bait unhung? Yeah, it can be tricky, uh, you know, especially if you're fishing from shore. Uh, it's really difficult sometimes because you can't really get those uh, angles, you know, that you need to get to pop that bait loose. Typically, when you're working a bait to you and it gets hung up, uh, you're on the front side of whatever you're hung up on. So the number one thing you can do is try and get your rod tip behind where the bait is hung and apply pressure from that back side. And usually that'll pop it free, not always, uh, but that's, that's usually the number one thing you want to do. Um, 
something that I do that you're not supposed to do, it's really not a good idea to do, is if you're in shallow water, you can kind of push your rod tip down and follow your line down to the bait and kind of push it off with your rod tip. But that's a really good way to break a rod. And I have broken several doing that. Um, but, you know, if you're careful, you can get your bait unhung that way. Uh, another good way is to kind of pop your line. You kind of pull your line with your hand and give it a, a quick release. And that'll give the, the bait a little bit of slack. And it'll allow that bait to kind of float up and back off of whatever it's hung up on. Uh, crankbaits especially. Uh, especially if you're throwing a crankbait that that wants to float, uh, you can kind of give it a little bit of slack, and a lot of times it'll back up off what it's hung on and end up floating back up to the surface. Um, but doing that from the bank, from the shore, is difficult. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that from from a boat uh, or a kayak. <clears throat> but um, yeah, just giving your line some uh, slack, uh, giving it a pop, or getting on the back side of whatever you're hung on and applying pressure to lift it out of, uh, out of your rock or your stump or whatever you're hung on. It's a good way to get them free. They also make uh, lure knockers. Uh, it's a, basically a big piece of metal uh, with uh, different appendages on it to grab a hold of your bait. And you tie a piece of uh, string or twine or rope to it. And you try to get it tangled up in the bait. And then that rope kind of pulls it free. Um, so if you're fishing somewhere where you get snagged a lot and you lose a lot of baits, you might want to invest in a, uh, they call it a plug knocker or a lure knocker. Um, it's got a few different names, but, uh, that, that's a good tool to keep if you fish places that you get hung up a lot. I know it saved me, uh, I've saved a lot of money using one on Cedar Creek Lake with all the stumps out there. Uh, if you're fishing Cedar Creek or a place with a lot of standing timber, uh, you might want to invest in a, in a plug knocker for sure. So they also make some that are on extendable poles. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like the, uh, you know, you see those poles that golfers use to reach into the pond and dig their, uh, golf balls out. They make those extendable poles with, uh, uh, lure retrievers on the end. So you can wrap that around your fishing line and push it straight down your fishing line and it'll eventually go to your bait and you can kind of hook it up on that pole and pull it loose that way. But um, there's, there's a few tools out there. You know, if, if you, like I said, if you fish places that are real snaggy, I know a lot of guys fish uh, below the dams on the Kentucky River and the Ohio River, and there's always a lot of snags and stuff to get hung up on. So uh, a tool like that would be a good investment for sure. Well, I think that's all I have. Does anybody else have any questions for myself or Jay? Feel free to unmute and ask if you don't feel like typing in the chat. It's perfectly fine. Okay. That's about all I got for general general bass fishing anyway. Uh, that's what I know most about. And, you know, just kind of give you a quick rundown and just kind of recap everything. Uh, in the spring, as you're coming out of uh, – <clears throat> winter time kind of what we're at right now i like to throw uh different crankbaits until i can figure out what the fish are structured on and what they're hanging around uh once you start getting up into the spawn and these fish start coming up on the banks that's when your soft plastics uh your your worms your your beaver style baits that kind of stuff starts coming into play um as you get more into the summertime you know your uh, your bladed jigs and grass your bigger worms, your bigger swim baits, uh, your bigger bulkier creature baits. It's a great time to throw those. Uh, as you start getting into fall, uh, that's when your topwater frogs, uh, all, all other topwaters, uh, sinkos are still playing a big, big factor. Uh, soft plastic still playing a big factor. Um, swim jigs, that kind of stuff. Um, that, that's really as you're getting into fall, those baits become prevalent. And then year round, uh, you know, you've got your jigs. Those are good year round. Uh, you can throw spinner baits year round. Uh, just depends on your uh, speed and your depth, that kind of stuff. But uh, that's kind of big overview. And, you know, I think if you guys take some of these, uh, just keep it simple. That's, that's really the biggest thing. You know, these baits and lures and stuff can get complicated. It can get deep. 
uh, but just keep it simple. Uh, follow some of these general guidelines, and I think uh, I think you should have some success uh, out of using some of these baits this year. Uh, whether you're fishing creeks or rivers or lakes or farm ponds or whatever you, whatever you've got close by, um, just utilize some of these uh, general guidelines, and I think you'll have some success. Okay, so we got a, a good question, and I think it brings up a good point. It says, what about sunfish from shore? Now, that brings up the good point of all fish will go after artificial baits. So my suggestions for the sunfish would be like a Popeye jig or even just a smaller jig with like a grub trailer on it, especially if you wait for when they push up when they spawn and you can see the depressions in the dirt. Yeah, look, perfect. There's a little Popeye jig. Now, other people will put like little mealworms or wax worms on that hook too, and then just cast it out, let it sink over where the fish would be. But if you can catch them when they're spawning, you can find the depressions in the dirt and cast that out there and you'll catch a lot that way. You have any input on that? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, these Popeyes are classic baits for crappie, bluegill, sunfish, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not a bluegill expert by any means. I'm more of a a bass angler but uh you know studying the behavior of sunfish is something that i see a lot and uh you know they typically spawn what what would you say in about june when the water gets pretty warm uh so yeah looking for those depressions and you know throwing some of these really small baits like those popeye jigs <clears throat> wax worms that kind of stuff um i know those guys out at kentucky lake that that red air bite is the deal out there people love that bite um, and usually once you get in them, you know, it's not just one or two, you'll, you'll find a whole bunch. Um, so those Popeyes are really, really good baits for doing that. Tip them with a little wax worm and you're good to go. I would also suggest a, a rooster tail or an inline spinner, essentially like a condensed spinner bait, but you can work that over a large area and you'll probably catch other fish too, like bass and other non-target fish if you're just going for sunfish. <clears throat> Those are also good creek baits as well. Yeah, those rooster tails are really good for uh, trout and things, especially below uh, like Wolf Creek Dam at Lake Cumberland. I know a lot of those guys use rooster tails down there for trout. Very popular. That was a good question there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if there's no more questions at all, or if you think of anything, feel free to shoot me an email from that uh, email where you got your link in the Zoom. And if I can't answer it, I'll reach out to Jay or somebody else in the department. We've got a lot of awesome fisheries biologists here. That'll take care of answering all of your questions that you could have. Um, so we're gonna wrap this up now. Um, I would suggest that you look forward to more webinars like this. And if you have any ideas of topics, shoot me an email. I will also say we're gonna have another two webinars similar to this style that will cover catfishing 101, and then I'll have another one that will cover the topic of bow fishing. So look forward to those and keep checking back on the calendar. And if you want me to directly email you about these classes, you just shoot me an email. I will jump in there and say that if any of you guys have questions uh, about anything you guys want you know, to think of later, uh, you can find me on pretty much all the social media at Jay Wallen Fishing. Um, just feel free to reach out anytime if I can help you with anything. I'm also a pretty big kayak angler uh, here in the state of Kentucky, and we I do help run the uh, local club. We got the Bluegrass Kayak Anglers. Uh, so if kayak fishing's your deal, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I can help answer questions and steer you in the right direction if, as it comes to uh, kayak fishing. And like I said, we do have our local club. We put on a few tournaments every year. Uh, we're on Facebook under Bluegrass Kayak Anglers. So just wanted to get that plug in there. Appreciate it. Awesome. So I'd like to thank Jay once again for joining us tonight and thank everyone else for joining us. Thank you all.